Hi everyone, welcome back from our very short break this time um, and I'm really happy to welcome on our next two speakers and we've got Catherine Randall who is the CEO of um, of, uh, sorry, one second, CEO of Spangle X Mate, which is a hybrid production and creative agency and they really focus on trying to amplify um, brands and, and emerging talent. And alongside Catherine, we've also got Sunil Dovdi, who is the director of, um, of the professional um, part of the Adizis Leadership Institute. So really amazing speakers. I'm really looking forward to the session. So um, welcome to both of you. And then alongside you, um, we have also got um, your colleague, Harry, who I believe is going to be helping you out. And Harry is, um, a second year at Yale and is going to be kind of helping to lead the discussion. So we're looking forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks. Thanks. Hey there. So starting off, once again, thank you for the introduction. My name is Hallie Watson and I am so excited and honored to be here with Catherine and Sunil, two people who I've gotten to know a little bit in the past week and I'm excited for you guys to meet and hear their amazing stories. Um, but once again, starting off, we're going to talk about compassionate and heartful leadership and going through some couple definitions of what compassion is. And it's really the ability to feel for other people and that leaders have that you know, responsibility to take their emotions and then put them into their leadership. And I think Catherine and Sunil's stories are going to be amazing to learn how to do this. Um, but starting off, I'd like to ask our two speakers. In this poignant moment in history, how does leadership play a role and what can each of us do to become more compassionate and better leaders, in y'all's opinion? Catherine, if you'd like to start. Um, sure. Well, hi, Heli and Sunil, and hello, everybody out there. Um, so for us, uh, uh, we've been discussing, like Heli said, over a couple of days now, um, various different stories of, of our own personal journey through how to be more heartful with our leadership. But, um, but also the journeys of what's going on in the world today. And so um, one of the things that uh, for me, I'm actually not right now, I'm, at, I'm in Northern New Jersey at, um, at my aunt and uncle's house, which is very lovely and has mountains in the background, but I live in Brooklyn uh, in New York City. And so I am currently in the heart of both the, um, the COVID experience. Uh, my zip code is one of the highest uh, death tolls for COVID in the, in the world. And I'm also, so one of the things that I've been discussing is for me, something that's been really interesting uh, is, is Governor Cuomo, who uh, has actually been able to broadcast globally um, about his, his daily COVID updates. And something that really has stood out for me, I've worked for many years as an advisor to various CEOs and leaders and um, and his biggest message and mantra for everyone has been about how New York is tough, smart, united, disciplined, and loving. And he ends every one of his updates with that. And what it really reinforces um, for us in, in Brooklyn, especially where it's extremely densely populated and, you know, I can't walk more than like five feet without passing four or five people on the street. Um, we put our masks on not to protect me, but to protect you. And there's a, a thing about if each individual takes up their own rights of leadership and says, okay, I'm going to lead by example and go out there and do something because I'm trying to do the greater good for the company, the community, for my school, the organizations that I'm working with. Um, there is a mindfulness, a heartfulness, and also a compassionate way that we can really dive forward. Um, and so that's one of the big things that kept coming up for me, at least in the conversations this week around this. Um, and then of course, going back to the protests as well, which have so many different things which we'll touch base on and talk about, but most of the protesters had their masks on and there was this kind of duality between this massive movement that has to happen and needs leadership in all sorts of ways and people coming out and standing up and saying, yes, I believe in it, but then also saying, oh, and by the way, I don't want you to get sick while we have this conversation. Um, so that for me has been part of it, but uh, Sunil has some really good, really good stories too. Uh, and we'll let, let you start a little bit just in case I get cut off again. <laughs> 
And I, I think we all got, uh, there was a slight interruption of maybe ah. some kind of sunspot or maybe the Saharan dust storm, I'm not sure what's ah. going on. But uh, good day to all of you and it's, it's really a pleasure to be, be with you all. And it's, uh, you know, the, the, the heartful leadership I can talk a lot about, but then the compassion really threw me for a loop because the word compassion has got a very interesting meaning. And if you look at the definitions, they all lead towards some in you know, a more empathetic, there's a softness of sorts that comes into play. But if you look at the world of business, or if you look at the world of uh, anything else, there's, there's a toughness there too. So, so the question is, how do these coexist? And this reminds me of, we were flying, my wife and I were flying back, I live in Mexico now, and we were flying back through Houston. And in the lounge, we met a lady who was uh, a yoga student in my wife's yoga studio, and, and they got chatting, and I was overhearing the conversation. And she was complaining about, you know, the Mexican government, blah, blah, blee, blee, and you know, why they are not doing certain things. And she, you know, if the narco guys, you know, stood for power, she'd vote for them because they were much more integrated, compassionate, and, uh, and, and, and there was a goodness there. Now, you can look at the, uh, the, drug, uh, the drug lords and the drug dealerships and that whole clan, but if, imagine finding compassion in that environment. Many times you don't even think about compassion. So compassion can actually spread, uh, can span multiple uh, layers and, and sometimes, you know, just with time, because these guys, you know, they take care of their own, they take care of their tribes, the community, and obviously there's an ulterior motive for that protection, but, uh, but compassion can be very, very profitable. So that's, that's just a way of looking at this, uh, the same term. And, and if you look at Colombia, the whole experience in Medellin, there used to be this guy, Pablo Escobar, who was again uh, a drug, um, yeah, I mean, he's, a, he's quite famous, but, uh, but now if you go to Medellin, it's, it's a beautiful story. And, and a number of uh, the mayors from Mexico and other places go to Medellin to see the transformation that happens. So again, I think there's many, many crisis moments. Many things are happening. And, and sure, I think these are, these are phenomenal opportunities and many times we work with many clients and we pretty much say, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste because this is something that's a moment in time that can really propel us because crises have been here for, for so, many, so many eons. And really what a crisis is, is a change in a very, just in, 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 a, in a much more rapid manner. So it, it actually accelerates the change because change is happening. Sometimes it goes slow, but the crisis just accelerates a number of things. And it's also a call for us to deal with some things that haven't been dealt with before. So the problems that haven't been solved before end up in a crisis mode, similar to you know, our health situation. You end up in an emergency room, typically if you haven't taken care of some certain parts. Now you can have accidents too, for sure. But, uh, but many a time we go into crisis mode when, when there's been a long period of neglect. So, uh, so, so this is just, you know, a little crying baby saying, hey, time to wake up, need some help, let's, uh, let's go do something. So, so compassion to me, again, just to come back to that loop, it's almost like a, a worm on the hook when you go fishing to, to help you get in. So to try and find a way into this place where I think we're moving more from the thinking to feeling and more intuitive kind of ways of, of looking at the world of management, leadership, and, uh, and, and, the, and those nine yards. And quite frankly, and I think since this is the heartfulness community, it's really a pathway to love. And the big opportunity is, you know, how do you make love and work and business and, uh, and other things, you know, coexist? And it's not, I think what we're coming to realize now is not, they're not uh, separate, it's almost if they don't coexist, you, you, don't, have a, you don't have any way to, to move forward on. Because very often they used to be, when I was growing up, you know, business is business and personal is personal. And the two shall not meet. You know, and people would go from, from home uh, to work and this, all this business of work-life balance. Well, well, COVID has thrown that out in five seconds. You go figure out where your day starts and where your day ends. Mm -hmm. So I think these are all great opportunities to go and, and learn something. And... Uh, so, so that's my thing with compassion. Compassion is this little hook to figure out, but I think the journey is just starting. And yeah. there's a lot more to be learned. So much of what you're saying, Sunil, um, reminds me that 
the number one way that a true leader is effective is being able to see their the people that they're trying to lead so if it's in the corporate world or again amongst like even if it's a coach right a coach of a team if you see each of the individual players and truly see them that's how they feel the compassion the love the understanding and one of the heartful ways to to be a really effective leader so there's something even to go back to Cuomo, right? There's something in the way that he speaks to the crowd and the crowd is a global audience by saying, I see you, we're doing this for you. You're in charge of your own destiny here in order to help make the rest of the world better. So let's figure out a way that you play an important integral role. Um, in many of the, the leadership roles that I've had at various organizations, the most effective thing for me has always been knowing everyone's name, knowing where they come from, figuring out like what it is that is the biggest part of their job, even if their job is just stocking the refrigerator for the rest of the team, you know, it's figuring out how do I let you know that I see you and I honor that. And as you're talking about Medellin and everywhere else, it's, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a drug lord or if you're you're actually working at a Fortune 500 company. Um, Paul Pullman used to run Unilever and he would do the most incredible job of always knowing like the entire set. There was like hundreds of thousands of people. He couldn't know every single person, but man, was he amazing at remembering people's names and coming in and being like, all right, Bob, you're doing that. So great to see you, Sally. I'm glad this is happening. And, and I think even amongst any kind of nefarious or not kind of role if you come in and you say to your your team or to your family members you know what i see you tell me how it's going tell me how we can make this better how can we be more effective in what we're doing and you can contribute i think that's one of the most heartful ways to go because as we talk about even black lives matter right the biggest part of black lives matter is people making sure that you can acknowledge white privilege or your stance in the world to say actually, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't know before, but now I'm conscious of, I need to be more conscious to just listen and hear you. Tell me what your story is, tell me how that made you feel, and tell me what you think is the way forward. Because we can come to any type of agreement on any, whether, I mean, in, in America right now, there's so much divisiveness. I, I've spent the weekend with my family and, uh, and it, a couple of different aunts and uncles, and we are totally polarized on our political views, but we are sitting around a table making sure that we're listening and actually having the tough conversations as a means to, to getting to what could possibly be a path forward. And that is a lot about what leadership is, is being able to take the time, the heartfulness approach and go, just tell me what you wanna say. Tell me what's going on. Um, so for me, I, as I hear, every time actually I hear Sunil speak, I think, I think of that because you, you've got that great story about your family council and things of that nature. And it's about listening. So much of leadership is actually listening. But yeah. So, so it's Anybody? interesting. So sorry, yeah. Kelly, you were saying something? Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say a lot of this is so ringing true again with experiences from my life. And I think an important way to make people understand that you really care about them is that active listening. It takes a second to bring yourself back down to a level and say, I'm going to sit here, put my attention on you for a minute and, and take in everything that you're saying. It's not just listening to respond, but listening to internalize. And leaders have to do that to understand, you know, how to connect with people and how to go about their lives. And I think something that both of you touched on is this understanding that pe everybody can be a leader. Leadership is not just for people in places of power, CEOs of companies. Everybody can be a leader in their daily lives, whether or not it's with their family or with their friends. Again, in, in times like this, it's important to to act as a leader in those small groups. And so I wanted to ask you guys what you would say to those those people who aren't necessarily in places of power, but still want to make an impact in, in the arenas that they are in and how to be a heartful leader like that. Actually, that's a, that's a beautiful segue into what I was going to, I think, let's go back to the definition of leadership. Leadership is not a, a right or a, a title or, 
or an entitlement for that, for that matter. Many times people say, if you're the big boss, you're the leader, which is, that's true, but I think leadership is more resilient if it's distributed. If you have many people who can perform the leadership function because there's a, so what is leadership? Leadership is trying to integrate people around a particular common objective and then you go for it. And it doesn't have to be, you know, just the domain of the people at the top or so-called wise ones. In fact, by and large, there's a lot of blindness that happens. And the, one of the best visual examples I can give you is uh, the, the Blue Angels. The Blue Angels are these Navy uh, flight demonstration team. They fly these, these jets, the F-18s, and they, they, it's, it's a phenomenal thing. And I watched them and we, we as a family would go watch them and, and, and grew up with some of their principles. Now, this is an all-volunteer team. They're in the Navy and the Marines, but they come and they fly together as volunteers. And the selection process is very unique. So when people apply to come into the, to this team, they have to be, there has to be a unanimous acceptance by all the people that are accepting the new pilots on. And every, or not, not only the pilots, even the ground, ground staff. And every two years, they change over completely. When they're flying, there's, uh, there's four jets that fly. And there's, uh, again, one, two, three, four. And the number one jet is called the boss. And he's the senior most pilot. And the number four jet is the junior most pilot. So when they're flying straight up, the boss, and you can listen to their commands, and the boss is giving the commands and showing them how to go. But when they fly upside down, the command shifts from the number one to the number four. So the number four pilot, who's the junior most pilot, now fortunately they've also accepted women. Women are now part of the team. So when they're flying upside down, the boss moves from number one to number four. So this is exactly how leadership has to adapt because things are changing so fast. You can't rely just on one, one level to understand. And uh, again, staying with this, with this uh, analogy of, uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true story that Dr. Jesus was, uh, he is one of my mentors and part of the founder of the Institute we have. So he was in, in, the, in Israel and watching this general who, was, um, who had the screen and they could see you know, the entire territories around Israel because they're always under attack. So, and the general could basically see, you know, where, where things are popping up from enemy zones. So this one person who's, who was now the general was showing Dr. Jesus proudly, you know, this big board of, you know, where things are. And these, uh, this Syrian MiG, you know, flew up and crossed into Israeli territory. And he was, he scrambled and he went after this MiG. And, uh, and then the, the MiG, understood this guy was coming from, he turned around and went back. Now the general sitting in the war room told this pilot to disengage. If this guy's gone back, disengage. But he didn't disengage. He went after him and then actually shot the plane down. The, the, the other pilot escaped because they, they parachuted out. And the doctor just asked him, man, you disobeyed the general's order and did you get court-martialed or what? He says, no, I got promoted. Because in the Israeli Air Force, the command shifts because the you're just watching a screen, you don't know what's going on. This guy is in the field and knowing how to delegate and knowing how to shift that is, uh, is, a, is a critical part of leadership. Now, had there been an international incident, had he made a mess, he says, I knew it was my responsibility to make sure this thing happened correctly. And uh, so that's an example of, you know, you can see leadership examples all over the place and it doesn't have to be military. But my father just sent me a, a video of uh, Patch Adams, you know, there was this Thing. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but, but he was a bit of a rebel and he, was, he became a student and was taking on the medical profession to say, hey, you guys are just going, going at it the wrong way. So, so that's, uh, that's an example because he had all these high doctors, but this guy was changing the, changing the system. Catherine, over to you. Yeah, which is so important for this particular group, right? Uh, when you look at Gen Z, which many of you in the audience are, you guys are just phenomenal at not taking rank as a means of leadership, right? So whether we're talking about uh, Greta or the, the large group of, uh, of formerly student, but still student activists in America who are suing America for crimes against their generation on climate change, whether we're talking about Black Lives Matter or we're talking about um, any multitude of, of mass group organizational leadership that's happening within the the generation that is right now at the forefront of, of all things <laughs> um 
there is really something beautiful to be said about how that works. And I have um, a line that I created for one of my old companies and it, it says that leadership is like the moon. It, it drives the tide. And right now the tide of change is happening all over the world and in sort of this unified voice that kind of comes from your generation truly and so it's amazing to me watching this experience because as Sunil said it doesn't have to be that you're necessarily the boss or you're the person in the point of authority to be the person that leads us on what's the way forward and um, I really put it back to all of you to think about like how are you doing that and it can be on a very small scale. Your leadership might be in a party of two or three, right? I mean, it might just be your household or your roommates. You've decided to be the person that leads the charge on who cleans the house better <laughs> and makes things more efficient, you know? Who's gonna be the person that ensures that we don't have a pile up of garbage today? And that garbage could be big or small because when we are talking about things like climate change, you know, who's, who's taking out the trash is really a, a, a bigger metaphor for things. And, um, and sometimes having the awareness of yourself and knowing your mindfulness and then your heartfulness, why are we taking this approach is what's the most important thing. So as you've gone through the last three days, figuring out ways to become more centered, understanding everything from like, how do you stand with your posture with your feet on the ground to how do you actually get yourself wrapped around some of the bigger like heart, mind, body experiences. Once you have another one of my, my lines I love to talk about, when, you talk, when you're on an airplane, there's a reason they tell you to put the oxygen mask on you before helping others. Once you've actually put that oxygen mask on you and you've filled yourself up and you say, okay, I know where I need to be, I know where I feel centered, here's how I'm going to help my family, my community, the world, how I'm gonna lead today by example. And all of those things really come back to a sort of heartful, compassionate approach to what it is you want from life, what it is you want from others. So Neil was talking about how now, I mean, for most of, of you, I'm sure you're FaceTiming with your friends and, and WhatsApp videoing them all the time. And it doesn't really, it's not anything new because of COVID, but now that we have entered this new playing field where working from home is probably going to be the norm, there is this different relationship to work and family and life. I, I have a five month old baby. It's my new, my new role that I'm playing. And uh, the two of them have met Rosalie so many times because it's almost impossible for her to not join me on these Zoom calls. Uh, she's up for a walk with her dad today, so you probably won't get to see her, but she is so integrated into everything that is my work experience because it's impossible not to. And if work and life at home have now kind of melded into this shared experience, it may change the way we work and the way we act as leaders. How are you gonna tell a subordinate in your job not to do something or do something when you yourself are standing there trying to like take care of your kids? <laughs> and, and so that's another interesting, heartful leadership example because whether you are you know, going out there and starting a, an activist experience on, on climate change or Black Lives Matter, or you're starting a, a, a board meeting, you really are thinking about how does this affect me? How does this affect my family? How does it affect my community? How does it affect the whole world? And that's actually a really big part of why this compassionate, heartful leadership is something that has to almost become a part of our daily existence. Um, I don't know, Hallie, do you have any more on that or, or what we've been talking about or? <laughs> no, absolutely. No, it's, it's so wonderful, again, to look at my generation and like what you said, to understand that we all are taking it upon ourselves to be those leaders and to actively create change. Sorry, my dog, you may hear him in the back, but um, to create change in our everyday lives. And it's been so heartening to see that, you no, know, it doesn't matter who you are. Everybody understands that it takes the one step in your life to do that and and even though that step may be small it may be talking to your family about what's going on in the news it could be talking to your friends about what's going on in the news it's it's those small bits that really do make the difference um 
But yeah, I have some questions from the audience that I've been scanning. If you guys would like to start on those, does that sound good? Okay. Absolutely. Um, one that I think is pretty related to what we've been talking about um, says this, we all talk about being leaders, but we need worker bees to correct. Is my assumption wrong? Should everyone be a leader? And how do you strike a balance between leading and following? And I think that's really interesting to hear from your guys' perspective. Hmm. So, so the, yeah, so let, let, me, let me tackle that one. So the, let's talk about, I think there's a confusion between uh, what leadership is and, 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 uh, and, and the word management, because the, the words have actually changed. Because if you look at the, the history of the word, uh, so it started off with uh, this guy, you know, Taylor, you know, the, the scientific management, you know, how do you divide work up into little chunks so you can, you know, you make, you make humans into machines and, and they just, you know, basically just do their little thing and they you make them specialize on certain things. So it was basically, when if you look at the first school of management was the graduate school of business administration. So it was, a, it was more of an administrative kind of thing. And then there was this uh, thing which said, you know, administration is just a piece of the action. It's not the whole action. And then uh, it, it moved into, uh, uh, in, into, you know, the, 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 the this uh, management shifted from uh, administration to management. And then if you look at management, the word management, uh, you know, the French, by the way, who are very proud of their language, don't have a French word for management. They use the English word. In Spanish, the word manejar only refers to when you drive something like uh, drivers or if you handle horses, it's not dealt with, you know, handling people. So, so many times certain languages don't have this word. So if you, if you start thinking about this, the management is just a human construction that we've created now, as we're seeing this thing evolve and then, and basically they say, you know, then later on they found out, oh, management is just for middle managers. You know, we don't, it's, it's, you know, what we need is a more amplified thing. Let's call it executives. So it went from administration to management to executive. And then, you know, that CEO word came along. And so, so it's, but it's the same phenomenon with, you know, in, in, uh, with different words. And then, you know, in the 70s, 80s, the word executive wasn't doing too well. So the word leadership came along. Let's, you know, let's amplify it with something else. But fundamentally, the, the paradigm hasn't shifted. So if you look at the word management, administration, leadership, or executive, they've all personal, uh, uh, personalized the, the function of management. And as time has gone by, actually management has become very inefficient. There's a lot, a lot of layers that come into play because I don't need to be managed. At the end of the day, if I can be self-motivated, if I have personal accountability, you can do away with a bunch of layers in the system. And I think that's what the world is actually calling for, out for especially now. So the worker bees, absolutely, because sometimes, so right now I may have a certain role in, in, in my organization, but in my home, I, my station is the dishwashing unit, because by the way, in Mexico, we don't have dishwashers. Like mm -hmm. in America, we actually wash by hand. Now in the kitchen, my wife is the boss. She's, she's the boss of the kitchen, but I am the boss of the dishwasher section, you know, in the <laughs> kitchen. So, so it doesn't make a difference. So, so this whole concept of, uh, you know, who's doing work, because sometimes and you, you think there's got to be worker bees, but very often the purpose of leadership is to get the heck out of the way and make sure they enable the system and they, or they create the system for the most desirable to naturally occur. And I don't need people, you know, beating me up and say, you know, are you doing your work, not doing your work? And by the way, there's so many other hang-ups that exist in the structures. You, you think of a factory that's, you go in, the first thing you do, you clock in, you go through this metal bars of detection and they check, you know, what, you, what you're taking in and if you're coming out, so you go through security. So what do they tell you? I don't trust you to do your work. You better come on time. I don't trust you to be, to be honest. So you're, you're basically going into a prison and, and I don't think the world is essentially looking for that kind of a, a structure. And I think part of the thing it, that's evolving is, is the level of free, people want freedom, people want, and, and, and if you can imagine self-accountability, that's the best, uh, the best kind of accountability there is. But very often we, we impose ourselves through old habits, but I think that's part of the shift that we're slowly seeing you know, ready, waiting to happen. So worker bees, yes, are necessary, but that doesn't, that's not the domain of uh, leadership only. So sometimes if I have to carry, in fact, my, 
my associates, you know, they're doing some good work. I'm saying, I'm here to carry your bags. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as we can get the ego out of the way, which ties back to this heartfulness. And that's the, the classic ego busting system, if, if I can call it that. Catherine, I know you've got something to say uh, too. I mean, for sure, I'd love to add uh, quite a few things to this. It was perfectly framed that um, there's, there's a couple of ways we could approach this concept, right? Because one, I hope, I pray really that the, the current corporate structure is shifted a little. There are some companies that do some very fascinating things where no matter what your role is that you're hired for, you actually have to spend some time in every single department, whether you are actually in the janitorial room or you're you know, actually the CEO, in order to understand the importance of every person's job. And then the other thing to that is that for me personally, um, early in my career, I spent a long time working as an executive assistant and always being the most junior person in the room, which then led me to like a chief of staff role, then to more of an advisory role uh, before becoming an executive myself in many um, departments. And what I have found is there were a lot of times earlier on in my career where I managed up. So the leadership of me as, as an executive assistant or as somebody who was trying to work from the bottom to get the leaders to do things, which we would think, or the management to do something, came from the, the leadership at, at the, the bottom end and that of this pyramid that really doesn't have to work that way. Um, I mean, <laughs> so I worked at the World Economic Forum, which is the Davos folks and all of that. And uh, my first role there, which is kind of nutty and, and but sort of wildly wonderful, my first job there was sort of on a whim. I, I was in between things, got married, and I was about to, uh, to transition where I was living. And I took a, a temp job as the dishwasher. Now, I have a, an honors degree in, in business management. I went to medical school at Columbia University. And they were like, why in the world are we going to take you to like organize the closets and unload the dishwasher? And I was just like, because I'm going to be here and I'm going to help you and it's going to be wonderful. And I really had to convince them to hire me to do this job. And I did that job. And, it, you know, three weeks later, then they put me on another team and another team, and another team. But it's the greatest opportunity I think I've ever had because I then several years later was sent to help open their California office. And in doing so, my operations people who did unload the dishwasher, I was like, I've had your job and it's great. So you got to tell me what we need to make this place run. I can't do it unless you lead me on how we get it done because you know better than anybody else how this is going to work. So it's not so much worker bees as it is, we are all worker bees, right? I mean, if, they're, if the structure is that someone is the queen, I guess that's okay. But that queen doesn't ever actually leave, doesn't make the, the hive work, doesn't operate all of it. Like every person's job is really important and they can be a leader in just how, how they appreciate their job, how they, they, they take pride in what they're doing and, and appreciate the people that they're working with. Um, leadership doesn't have to only be rank. And so if we can change the corporate structure even more so that way, which many like Silicon Valley jobs in different places, autonomy is key is, is a lot of what Sunil was saying, right? If you're, if I trust you that you're going to go do your, your job, you can work from home. You can work in a swing over there while the other guy is, you know, at Google and places like that. It's like, it, it's kind of like you're at Disneyland, you know, it's like, go do whatever you want. You can you know, eat lunch upside down and <laughs> use a pogo stick and, and then you're going to produce some of the greatest work ever for me. And it really doesn't matter what your job is and what your rank is. It's really just about you taking your, your task and wax on, wax off and really getting into what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So yeah, it doesn't, there shouldn't, you shouldn't think of it like worker bees per se. You should think of it like I take pride in what I do whatever that is. And I think you can, so maybe some people would be, uh, and I get asked this question a lot, okay, this is great for the for people who are in the high tech world, but what if, what if we're in manufacturing and they have to come to work on the line and, and be there present, otherwise everything stops. And 
And I think it, it applies in that context too, because you can still, so we, I, but I have a client and, uh, and by the way, they have a video that's been made, a case study, it's a forging company. Forging is a, it's a pretty dirty industry. It's, it's like blacksmiths, but in a, it's a, it's a high tech blacksmith. And these guys, uh, it's called Frisa. Frisa is the name of the company. And it's a 30 minute video that shows their story. But these workers, when they come to work, they come to work like little kids. They come to work with a level of excitement. There's a sense of anticipation. And one of the core values they have, you know, in terms of how they treat each other, everything we're talking about, how to listen, how to argue. In fact, the worker can you know, talk up to the boss and say, you know, you're, you're, you're wrong because of this, 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 because I see these other things. So this, this culture of, of mutual trust and respect, where basically respect means I'm talking to you because we are going to have a disagreement and we're going to learn from each other and we make it better. And when they ship the product, now they ship these big rings, it's all steel and it's you know, metal and, and they're beating metal you know, into different shapes. But when they ship the product, they, they have a term called producto con angel. So product with angel wings. So they actually ship the product to wherever it's going to go. It's going to go to some oil, oil well or oil rig, or it's going to go in a windmill or go in a jet engine. But they ship it with, uh, with, with a blessing and, uh, and, and love. So you can see how love can actually come in. So it's not compassion only about the people, but also respecting your machine, respecting your workplace, respecting keeping it clean. And one of the, one of the ways they sell, you know, when clients come to their organization, they oh, let's, let's go, we'll go through the, they actually take them through the restrooms of the workers. So they go to the bathrooms and most of the, you know, the GE executives and all that, they're shocked. How can this be so clean? How can, this is cleaner than a five-star hotel. Mm -hmm. So just that, uh, that sense of the environment, people take so much pride and people want to come to work there. And it's not about, uh, and sure, if they, if they have other things to do, but it's a question of self-organizing. And if you can somehow create the self-management structures, they actually work much better than having somebody, you know, bossing you around and telling you when to show up and not to show up. So, so there's, there's examples and this is, not, this is not something that happened yesterday, it happened in the late 90s so it's not a it's not something that uh, uh, that we have to even dream about it's, uh, it's it, it can easily be accomplished mm. no, sorry Hallie, i don't know if you have some other questions popping up no for sure and just adding on to a little bit of what you guys are talking about catherine when you mentioned this pyramid type scheme um my you know, education as a leader was always about servant leadership. And whenever I am talking about leadership, I'll always bring this up because it's the most important thing to me about how when you when you think of the corporate scheme, you know, you have a small bit of leaders at the top of the pyramid and then it goes lower. The idea in servant leadership is to flip that pyramid and that the leaders are at the base supporting everybody else. And I think it's important to understand that every one of us can be that person and taking pride in what you do, whether or not it's so small as cleaning the bathrooms is something that can make that small impact that can then support the whole. And so truly servant, I, I think this all heartful leadership, servant leadership, they really do connect um, in the way you guys are talking about. But um, for our last 10 ish minutes, um, I was going to, and we kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but the question is what if people higher up in your organization do not care to hear from people at every level? How can someone in the middle of the food chain decide to implement heartful leadership and then impact others on? Do you want to go first? Sure, sure. So the, the good news is, so here's the, here's the trick that I've learned. By the way, if you think of the heart, uh, I, I'm going to be a little bit uh, controversial here because and so I, was, I was actually thinking about, uh, I was flying back from here from Monterey. I was living in California and on the flight back about eight years ago, I was wondering, you know, when people pass away, when they, you know, when all is said and done, very rarely in the funeral or the obituary, they say, thank goodness this guy's gone, you know, the world's, you know, the world's a better place now without this person. By and large, most people say, you know, this person came, they did their best, they tried to do whatever they could. And, uh, and, and then we wish them well on the next, uh, on the next adventure. So if, the question is, if everybody is trying to do good, regardless of how they behave, but if everybody's trying to do the best they can, how come the world is so messed up? And the, the aha, the, aha that came was basically it's everybody's got their own their own thing but when we come together there's all this friction that we create 
and there's this rubbing around and, and then we try to, you know, uh, I mean, many times I've seen so many nonprofit organizations or uh, socially uh, conscious organizations that are doing good work, but they are canceling each other's work out. And for example, here in Monterey, there are three different organizations that are trying to strengthen the nonprofit sector, for instance. And if they just combine forces, which fortunately they're doing right now. So if they just combine forces, they could actually be much more effective rather than having you know, my brand of this or my brand of that. So, so the trick is, so the question is, how do you remove the friction? So if you think of uh, this friction, and Hallie, I know you're in the mechanical engineering space, so that's a, back to physics, there's three things to do when you, to, to reduce friction is, uh, first of all, you remove the unwanted parts, take out stuff, don't, uh, don't have extra stuff floating around. That's what Elon Musk did, right, with the electric car, just remove all the extra, you know, you go direct from the engine straight to the wheels. The second is streamlining. You actually streamline things and, uh, and that allows things to flow. And the third thing is lubricate. So, so a lot of times lubrication, you know, communication, but I would say many times communication is actually overrated because people are talking, 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 but there's, there's no connect. And uh, there's, uh, so I'm of the opinion that at least uh, 95% of communication is pretty useless. So, uh, so if, if it's not being effective, why are we even communicating? That's as, as an example. So back to the story of suppose you're being blocked. Now, one of the things I've learned from the heartfulness experience is that you can actually communicate without even talking. So there's a, and, and many spiritual systems talk about communion. So very, very often you're trying to you know, tell your kids what to do and, and there's always this fight that comes in. But, but over time, I, you know, we try this practice where we just, you know, heartfully suggest something and suddenly the kid changes their behavior. So you can actually create change if your own system is somewhat clean. So there's a powerful tool there that can be activated. And that's an example of maybe working with these, uh, with these uh, forces. On the other hand, I believe sometimes friction is very useful because uh, the con they put a constraint on you. So an example would be brakes, you know, in, 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 the, in the car you have brakes. And I keep asking people, what is the, the main purpose of uh, brakes in the car? So I don't want to put you on the spot, Hallie, but why do you think we have brakes in cars? To keep us safe in a way, just so your momentum doesn't take you, keep going. So, right, so, so yeah, you're, on, you're onto something. Most people say, you know, to, to be able to stop the car and, um, and, and to keep us safe. But, the, but, but that would be the, the common answer. But if you imagine what would happen to a car, how would you drive if you didn't have brakes? You wouldn't be able to, That's, yeah. You drive super slow. So basically brakes make us go faster. Yeah. So we can accelerate because we have brakes. So sometimes we think of, you know, and we sometimes don't realize that this person who's blocking us actually is doing us a real favor. So sometimes we actually are not aware. And I've, I've seen so many instances where I've, um, I've actually stopped many, many things. People say, this is good, this is good. And I've been the person blocking it, but that forces them to think outside the box and live within that constraint. So, so these are, you know, simple ways of, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, if, if, if you, um, if you, can't, uh, if you uh, can't, can't live with that environment, then go find another assignment or another adventure because you're, uh, you're not tied to, the, to that organization. Mm -hmm. But don't, I think the main thing I would say is don't give up too early because sometimes they might, you might be learning a life lesson by that, by that. Mm -hmm by that constraint. Yeah. Catherine. Yeah. Uh, to echo what you just said, again, we're, we're kind of continuing the same mantra over and over again, right? So you have to lead by example and you have to start with yourself. And so if you're middle management and you have a team underneath you, but you also have a team of bosses on, on, on the higher ranks of you and you really, you can't necessarily get what the lower ranks want for the higher ranks and there's a little bit of a, a divide what you do is you start by leading from for from example and it, it can be similar in corporate structure or even again when we talked about like being at your home right so how do you teach your children how do you teach your team a way to do things in a loving compassionate effective manner that they feel that they are actually being respected and even if you are in a scenario where you're not getting that kind of uh, 
love affair from your leadership that you feel like you deserve, you start by showing it in other ways. And, um, you know, you want to, you might not be able to tell your government exactly what you want or control it. But if you start within your household on how to be better and how to help enact legislation change, whether, whether it's in any of these different parameters, that's a part of that leadership that we're talking about, the heartful leadership, right? I mean, you have to find within you what it is that you aspire, and then you actually activate it by being that example of it. And, it, and it's really amazing how much like putting your mindfulness towards something does just unlock the keys to this. And um, it's pretty, it's really pretty impressive. So like if you are in a situation and it's really, really bad, yeah, start looking for a new job. But when you look for that new job or you start that, that new company, you're gonna do it in a way that creates the, the beautiful leadership that you wanted in the first place. And sometimes that is the leadership, right? You, you say like, I see another path, let me go there. And there, I can't even tell you how many times both myself and others have left organizations with their former boss because of exactly that situation. And they, they just go to the next place with them. So I think we're, we're wrapped on time, but heartful, heartful leadership begins with you. The compassion is inside you, so yay. <laughs> Sunil, do you have any last, last comment? Yeah, yeah just, uh, as, as, uh, just to, uh, as Catherine was talking, I was reminded of the last two, maybe five years, I've had this conversation with many, many uh, middle managers, CEOs, executives, but 90% of them, they basically, when we talk, they, they chose to stay in their current role because the message was, if I go do something else, there's, some, there's a lesson I need to learn here. And this is a gift that I've gotten. And if they go somewhere else, they're going to make the same mistakes. So may as well, you know, don't go from the frying pan into the fire because, you know, it, it may seem hot, it may seem uncomfortable, but that that constraint, you know, it looks like a pearl. A pearl is born out of an irritation. So a grain of sand goes in, and so there's a pearl waiting to be had, uh, to be to be born. And and if you can be resilient, then off we go. I think it's time. It's uh, so good to be with you all. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so all three of you, such a, an insightful conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so interesting to think about leadership and all these different levels and how we can kind of bring the heart to leadership. And you gave amazing examples of you. So thanks a lot for the discussion. It's really rich. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.